Your unit is dispatched to the local clinic for a 65-year-old female complaining of dizziness and vomiting. When you arrive at the clinic, the physician advised that she was seen in the ED a week ago for a similar complaint and that the head CT was normal. She was discharged with a prescription for meclizine. Three days after her ED discharge, the symptoms continued and she was evaluated by her primary care physician who then dismissed the cause of her symptoms as benign. Her symptoms continue to persist and because of that they are concerned and have secured a monitoring bed at the local hospital. When you stand her up to sit her on the stretcher, she cannot stand up without assistance and has a wobbly stance. Concerned for a stroke, you perform a Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale, which is negative, so you continue transport. Four hours later, the hospital calls you back for a transfer to a comprehensive stroke center, and you're told that the repeat CT scan revealed a cerebellar infarct. After that, you do some research and find out that cerebellar infarcts are not too uncommon and would often be missed by most pre-hospital stroke assessment exams. And you wonder why you were not taught this in paramedic school. And how many patients complaining of dizziness have you not transported to the appropriate facility because you did not know that this could be a symptom of a cerebellar infarct? about how to assess a patient complaining of vertigo or dizziness for a cerebellar stroke. There are just four easy assessment tools that you can use that can be easily performed in the pre-hospital field. So the first thing that we're going to do is consider the patient's history and risk factors for a stroke just like we would do any other stroke and we're especially going to want to know the time of onset. A stroke particularly um, is known to have a sudden onset. All right, so let's talk about just three or four quick assessment tools that you can use. Um, the first thing we're going to do is check the patient, and about the only thing we're going to do is check the patient for ataxia. Since the cerebellum is responsible for coordination in the brain, it's known as the coordination center of the brain, um, it makes sense that if that is affected, the patient's going to have a problem with walking, uh, moving, any fine motor skills. So the first thing I'm going to do is ask the patient to cross her arms. So if you'll cross your arms. So I'm looking to see if she can sit upright in the chair unaided without holding on to anything. A patient with a cerebellar stroke would find this difficult. Um, if they're unable to do this, we would call this truncal ataxia. They would move from side to side and not be able to maintain an upright posture. Okay, thank you. The next thing we're going to do is check the patient for limb ataxia. You may have heard of the finger to nose test. To perform this, I'm going to ask my patient to take her finger and touch the tip of my finger back to her nose and then back to my finger. So it's going to look something like this. Go ahead, touch my finger. Touch your nose, touch my finger, back to your nose. Good. You see how the, her, her movements were coordinated and fluid? Now, can you demonstrate what it would look like if a patient had limb ataxia caused by cerebellar stroke? So go ahead. There you go. See? She would deviate from side to side where it would be kind of spasmodic and not fluid. All right? And I'm going to ask her to do it with the other hand. Touch my finger, touch your nose. Back to my finger and back to your nose. Perfect. All right, so th that assessment check for limb ataxia. The next thing I'm going to assess for is nystagmus. Okay, now we all know what nystagmus is. So I'm going to ask her to look at my finger and follow it. All right, keep your head center. There you go. Follow it back. Perfect. Okay, so a patient with a cerebellar stroke. Um, would have nystagmus, meaning that their eyes would beat back and forth. 
patients with a cerebellar stroke have nystagmus that usually beats in the direction that they're looking. So if I ask her to look to the right, she's going to look to the right, but her eyes are just going to beat that way. All right. The next thing we're going to assess for is gait ataxia. Now, I always do this whenever I'm moving the patient from wherever their position is onto the stretcher. So if I have the stretcher right next to the bed where she's sitting or standing, I'm going to move it a few feet away. That way it kind of forces her to stand up and walk so I can evaluate her gait. And what we're going to look for is basically someone who has a, um, a drunk walk. They're going to walk like they're drunk, kind of with a staggering gait. Okay, So these assessments can help you tip the scales maybe for or against um, a cerebellar stroke that is caused by uh, a occlusive event to the posterior circulation that feeds the cerebellum. And this is important because it can help change your destination. Um, you may want to, instead, instead of taking this patient to your closest non-stroke center, you may want to take them a little further away to a comprehensive stroke center. And I also recommend that if, you, if the patient fails uh, any of these tests, that you notify the nurse or the physician wherever you're taking them that will help clue them in and hopefully they'll perform the right diagnostic tests or procedures um, since this is a pretty um, elusive stroke and it's frequently missed and we can make a big impact by picking up on it in the pre-hospital field.